Yeah. Well, we're in John chapter 18, so turn with me there. John chapter 18. If you're new to our chapel family, I'm a Bible expositor. I simply teach the scriptures in an expositional fashion, and all that simply means is we start with a book of the Bible, and we'll go through the first word, first verse, first chapter, and we'll work our way through the entire text to get its meaning. And first and foremost, we want to find out the technical understanding or interpretation of the text, because for every biblical text, without exception, now listen to me, for every single biblical text, how many technical interpretations are there? One, one, make no mistake. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there who do violence to the text, take it out of its context because context is king, and they violate the technical interpretation by trying to read into the text rather than to allow the text to speak for itself, to allow the text to come out with its truthfulness. What do we call that when we read into the text? Eisegesis. Exegesis, you allow the text to speak for itself. We allow the text to, to come forth. I said, Jesus, we read into the text. But there's a new term that's been coined today because we're such a narcissistic society, aren't we? Isn't it true? And what's that term? Narcissus. Narcissus is where all you see in the text is you. <laughs> it's, it's not about you. It's all about Jesus. Of course. Of course. Yeah, well, uh, contextually... What has taken place is that Jesus has celebrated the last Passover Seder. Seder simply means order. It's a Passover feast. It wasn't called the Last Supper. Hmm? It was called the Passover. Pesach. It's not resurrection. I mean, it's not Easter Sunday. It's Resurrection Sunday. It wasn't Easter that they celebrated, was it? What did they celebrate? Passover, the resurrection, Pesach, right? But unfortunately, a lot of that meaning is lost today. It's not understood. But Jesus was longing to celebrate that last Passover with those whom he loved because he was going to accomplish everything that he purposed to come to do. The redemption of those whom he loved, the forgiveness of our sins, and an entrance, a way made for us to go to heaven, to be with him forever and ever and ever. And as he celebrated that last Passover Seder, it's interesting, you know, and you know about the four cups that they drink that night. Well, that particular Passover, that last Seder that Jesus celebrated with his disciples, he didn't drink that last cup, did he? No, he didn't drink the fourth cup. He said, I'll not drink of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it with you anew in my Father's kingdom. And what was that cup called? The taking out. Hmm? Yeah. So that's when we'll drink that fourth cup with him, when he takes us out of the... You do believe he's coming, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you do believe he's coming for you to take you out of this world yeah. before the tribulation of this world really hits, before the wrath of God is poured out upon a very Christ-rejecting world. And, and we see how Satan and evil can so motivate and blind the hearts of men to where they will do the most horrible, barbaric, unjust acts of brutality. And so too with Jesus, the most pure, the most innocent, the most blameless, the most beautiful man that has ever lived. Fully God, but fully man. And they murdered him. And that's where we're going to be looking at, the beginning of the unjust trial, sentencing, and execution of our Lord and Savior Jesus. So they left the site. He finished the Passover. And in chapter 17, what was that about? The high priestly intercessory prayer of Jesus. First, he prayed for himself that he would glorify God in the suffering he was about to suffer. And he prayed for his apostles, those 11, specifically, that night who were with him. He prayed for their witness and their testimony of the truth. And then he prayed for you and I, all of us who would believe according to their word, according to the doctrine of the apostles, the apostles' doctrine upon which we stand, right? That's how he prayed for us, that we too would live a life that would glorify God, a live a life of self-denial, as those early followers of Jesus did, as he himself did, and so we are to do. And so now he's finished that prayer, and he knows now the end has come. His time has arrived. And he's going to cross over from the 
city of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, he's going to go across the Kidron and over into the Mount of Olives. So he's going to go from the west to the east. He's going to cross the Kidron Valley. And he's going to go into a garden area. These garden areas that were there on the Mount of Olives were uh, little gardens or oasis, little pieces of paradise that were owned by the very wealthy in Jerusalem. And we don't know who the resident was in Jerusalem who would give Jesus and his disciples access to this beautiful paradise, this beautiful garden to go and to be alone and to pray and to seek the Lord. But so often he would go there. And that's where we find him now. So let's pick up the text. Can we pray one more time? Lord, if, if you don't open up our eyes in our minds, in our hearts, to the understanding of this text, Lord, we won't see it for what it is. And Lord, if you don't give me the ability to communicate the truth of your word to these whom you love, then it, it won't be done, Lord. So, Lord, give me what I have not. Make me what I am not, Lord, for your glory, for the sake of your people, your kingdom, and for our own good, we pray, Lord Jesus, speak to us now. Give us revelation. Give us light. Give us life. Give us love. In Jesus' name, and everyone said. Amen. So when Jesus had spoken these words, he, that high priestly prayer that he prayed in the 17th chapter, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron where there was a garden in which he and his disciples entered. The brook Kidron wasn't much more than a little spring. We call it a, a creek, a creek, not a creek. You get a creek in your back, you get a creek in the yard, right? <laughs> so it's nothing more than a little creek. And in the summer months, it would be practically dry. In the winter months, there'd be a little bit of a stream that would flow. But if, how many of you have been to Israel? And so you know exactly where I'm talking about, the Brook Kidron. If you went down from the Mount of Olives, that's the east side of Jerusalem, you go down the Mount of Olives, you cross the Kidron uh, Valley, the Kidron Creek, or Brook, and then you're facing the east gate of the temple, remember? So that's, that's where they've gone from the west side now, they're going to the east. And the Brook of Kidron means dark. murky, dark. This is a dark place, this is a very dark hour for our Lord Jesus. David would write, years before, under the spirit of prophecy, that my dear friend who I may broke bread with has betrayed me. Who was David talking about then? You remember? Ahithophel, his chief counselor. And as David has to flee the city because his son, his own son Absalom, wants to kill him and take the throne, David has to traverse the same path going out of the city and down the valley, a dark place of the Kidron, murky, and then up the Mount of Olives to escape for his life. Jesus is making that same trek. But he's not going to try to escape. No, he came to give his life. And why did they call it dark or murky? Well, we know that this is the Passover, right? Jesus fulfilled the Passover. Jesus was crucified on the very day of Passover. What day was that? 14th day of the Jewish month. Nizan, Nizan, right? The very next day after his crucifixion was the 15th of the month. And what was that? Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, and meaning that the sin problem was dealt with, right? Anyone who was by faith believing in and living in Jesus, the sins had been removed. The leaven was gone, the leaven of sin. And then on the day following the normal Saturday Sabbath, which would be a Sunday, what feast was that? <laughs> feast of first fruits, right? And Jesus rose from the dead on the very feast of first fruits. And what day was that in which the year of our Lord was risen? What day of the month was that? The 17th day of the Jewish month, Nizan. Any coincidence there? What else happened on the 17th day of Nizan? Noah's Ark rested, the very 17th day. A new beginning for Noah and his family. 
The old world gone, passed away. Now a new world, new opportunity. Wow, what else happened on the 17th day of Nisan? Moses and the children of Israel left the bondage of Egypt, the mastery of Pharaoh type of Satan and sin, and they crossed over the Red Sea on the 17th day of Nisan. New beginning for the children of Israel, new beginning for Noah and his family, but all representatives, signs, symbol, and type of what Jesus has done for us. In Christ, it's a new life, it's a new beginning. Old things have passed away, behold, what? All things have become new. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, so much of this is lost, though, in the Goyam, the Gentile church of today, because they don't understand the Jewishness of the scriptures. Yes, the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, and Greek was a very expressive language. Uh, English is what we call a beggar's language. Why is it a beggar's language? Begs for more words. There's just not enough words in the English language. How many words are there in the Greek language to describe love? Five. You're close. You're only off by one. There's five. But each of them describe a different type of love. You know, hey, I love my dog. I love ice cream. I love Gail. I love Jesus. But it's all very different, isn't it? But, but using that English word love, we really don't understand the various meanings of the word love. But in the Greek text, oh, it just explodes with meaning, doesn't it? Yeah. And so it's important, even though it was written in the Greek language, in order to understand the text and understand the revelation, the light that God wants to bring forth, you need not only know the Greek, you have to have a Jewish mindset. So if you understand Jewish tradition, Jewish ways, Jewish customs, the, the Jewishness of our faith, it explodes with meaning, doesn't it? Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of that is lost today. But not for you, is it? No, we try to bring that out as we come to the text. Why? Because, listen, is Christianity replacing Judaism? No. What is Christianity in relationship to Judaism, ancient Hebraism? It's, it's, a, it's a fulfillment or the completion of all of the promises that God gave his people in ancient Hebraism, in Judaism. It's all fulfilled. Yeah. It doesn't really, we have not replaced Judaism. We have not replaced ancient Hebraism. We have not, the, the Israel is not replaced by the church. Do you understand that? Up at the Cove last week, we had some conversations around the table. It was interesting because there's a wide variety of people from many different denominations and persuasions that all come together up there at the Billy Graham Training Center. And, and I'm just shocked at the, at the amount of the massive ignorance within people who've been walking with the Lord for years with regard to a true understanding of the scriptures, the Israelogy of the Bible. I'm sorry? But they have love. Here we go. They did have a love, yeah. Better to have an ounce of love than a pound of head knowledge. Is that true? Yeah. And my, my, see, we balance each other. I'm the head and she's the... Yeah, yeah, it's a wonderful thing in marriage, isn't it? Compliment one another. Yeah. But they have love. But we want to have love with understanding. But if you have love and no understanding, what is that? Fanaticism, zeal, right? If you, have, if you have love or zeal or passion without understanding, it produces fanaticism, doesn't it? And God's not looking for religious nuts or fanaticism. He's looking for spiritual fruit. Now, if you're all head and no heart, you're stone cold. What do we call them? The frozen chosen. <laughs> I don't have love. So, so you got to have this beautiful combination, this beautiful marriage of both the head and the heart. Isn't that right, my dear? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so nonetheless, when you, when you look at the scriptures and you understand the scriptures from that perspective, you come away with a love for Israel and a love for the Jewish people you come away with a complete understanding of, of a biblical worldview, which means everything began and started where? In the Palestine with the Jews. And everything will end where? In the land of Palestine among the Jews. 
You understand that, don't you? And the way God looks at all of human history, as we know it, is in the way in which he's dealing with whom? Israel. You understand that, don't you? Not America. America doesn't have preeminence in God's eyes. England doesn't have preeminence. China certainly doesn't. <laughs> no, Israel, right? I'm just trying to make a point to you because I was, I was surprised that no, the number of people who didn't understand the serious negative consequences to replacement theology. What's the most serious consequence of embracing replacement theology? I'm sorry? Well, you, God does no longer. If God, if God cannot be trusted to keep his word to Israel, how can we trust him to keep his word to us? And some of the worst results of replacement theology is the anti-Semitism that is worldwide today. Again, the satanic motivated hatred of the Jewish people. That's a dark and murky place, isn't it? Well, the Kidron at this time was called dark or murky because during the Passover, the Passover celebration that Jesus fulfilled, right, on the 14th, the 15th, the 17th, fulfilled those first three feasts on the very day. There would be as many as a half a million lambs being sacrificed. And as those lambs are being sacrificed and they'd have to drain the blood of those sacrifices into the Temple Mount area, down into the valley. Where did all that blood go? Into the Kidron. What time of the year is the Passover? Spring. Spring. So it's not flowing freely like it does in the winter when all of the snows at Hermon are melting, and coming down across the Kidron. No, all of this blood is going down into this little creek. And what happens to that blood after it's been there a little while? It's no longer red. It's black or brown, murky and dark. Oh, that's what sin does, isn't it? Hmm? So Jesus takes him, his disciples across that same place where, where David in type had fleed from the assassination attempt of the king there by Absalom and his chief counselor, Ahithophel. And what a story that is, isn't it? And Jesus spoke these words, and he went with his disciples over the brook Kidron. And there was a garden there in which he and his disciples entered. <laughs> you have a prayer retreat? Where, 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 where do some of you go historically or regularly? Like, you know, if, if your husband, your wife, or your, one of your children want to find you, and they know you're about the business of your father's work and prayer, where would they find you? In your closet. She goes in the closet to pray. Yeah. So I said, Zickers, Zickers, where's mommy? And he goes to the closet. There she is on her little stool in her closet praying. That's where she likes to pray. What about you? Where, do you have a special place where you go to pray? Where is it, Sarah? I, I used to be in the back. I'm quiet time. Take a bath. That's not a, that's not a bad thing to do. Oh, no. It can be very therapeutic, right? And you talk to the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else want to share their, their prayer place? Carolyn. Uh, in my green chair with footstool yes. and computer room. Yes. Now, does Ed give you a little bell that you can ring when you need something? <laughs> no, he doesn't. Ed. He's in there, too. He's in there, too? In the green chair with you? No. <laughs> You're getting on to be that romantic, aren't you? <laughs> Anybody else? In my car. Actually. In your car. Yeah. yeah, yeah, your car. You can do a lot of praying in the car. <laughs> Especially. <laughs> I, I have people all over Greenville that pray for me when I get on 385 and 85. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. But listen, there's no question. Listen, they knew. Who was the betrayer? Judas. Judas. And Judas knew exactly where Jesus would be in a time when he was seeking his father and his father's comfort, his father's wisdom, his father's guidance, his father's love, his father's presence. He would be in that very special place, that garden, that little oasis, that Eden on earth where he and his disciples would go, lock out the whole rest of the world 
Did you start lining that box with aluminum foil yet? No. <laughs> we got a tip up at the cove, and the pastor there said, said, listen, line a box with aluminum foil, and when you get home, just throw your phone in that box. You can't receive any calls or text. You got to close the lid, too? Okay, okay. But my, my lovely bride, she loves to go dark. Now, I don't mean dark in a negative sense. I mean dark with no technology. She'll shut off the phone. The only time she'll make certain that phone is on is if I'm out of the house, because she knows she may get a call from the highway patrol. <laughs> but but it's, listen, it's important for you to have a time where you can go dark and cut everybody and everything else out so you can experience the Lord's presence and the power, the healing, guiding, comforting, restoring power of his presence when you're alone. For me, it's uh, very early, early hours of the morning. Some nights I don't sleep at all. I just enjoy his presence. I'll be reading, I'll be singing, I'll be meditating, and it becomes so restorative. She said, how can you function on so little? How can you function? He gives us the strength that we need if we're willing to spend the time. Now, John's gospel, unique from the synoptics, right? The synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Why are Matthew, Mark, and Luke called synoptic? Similar. similar. They're, they're similar. Most of them present the same material from a little bit different perspective. The Gospel of John is 90% all new material. Information that you will not receive in the synoptics, but there's a lot that John leaves out in this account that you, it would do you well to read the other three accounts of this particular time frame in Jesus' life. But for John's purposes, well, John wrote the Gospel of John for what purpose? To prove that Jesus Christ was God. And so what he's showing us here in his account is that Jesus is in complete control of the situation. Nothing's out of control. Don't you take comfort in the fact that that's true today? Yeah, these uh, buffoons and morons that are trying to run our country, they're not really in control. No, 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 our Father's in control. God is sovereign, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, coincidence? Not a kosher word, right? That's what the rabbi would say. No, no, God's in control of everything, and our Father's in total control, just as Jesus is in total control of this hour. He's finished his high priestly prayer. They've crossed over the brook Kidron, and now they've entered into this garden to pray. And Judas, who betrayed him, who knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Hmm. Why did Judas betray Jesus? Because he's so evil. Is that why? What did he betray Jesus for? Money. Money. Now, before you get too hard on Jesus, Judas, <laughs> you need consider what is your attitude towards money. Paul warns Timothy and says, Timothy, don't you understand that the love of money is the root of every manner of evil? It's amazing what people will do just to gain a little bit of wealth they can only hold on very temporarily. Isn't that true? Yeah. Who was it that won the $1.3 billion jackpot? We don't know. We don't know. But in all probability, what will it do to that person's life? Destroy it. Ruin their life. It's going to ruin their life. Judas betrayed the Lord, the Prince of Life, for a few pieces of silver. Now, listen to me. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm not trying to step on your toes. I want you to think. I want you to touch your heart. What does it say about a church where only 2% tithe? They're not trusting. They're not trusting, and they love their money more than they love the Lord. Now, that's a reality today. I don't know. I don't, look, I, you know, the only person who knows what anybody gives here is our administrator, Diane. That's it. I don't know. But I know that where you spend your time and where you're spending money indicates where your heart is at. And today, 
Today, the church in the United States of America, only 2% are obedient to the Lord in the tithe. What does that say? They have a greater regard for their money than they do being obedient to the Lord. Now, I'm not saying this because we need your money. We don't need your money. We don't, we're not even going to take an offering this morning. Did we take one last week? No. The week before? No. In 31 years of operation, have we ever taken an offering? No. no. We have no chicken buckets here. <laughs> and no clucking out there. <laughs> because God doesn't take anything from you. He receives what you offer him, what you give him. And what does he desire to receive more than anything else? Your heart, your, heart, your life. Judas would betray the prince of life for money. Don't be so hard on Judas. And Judas, having received a detachment of troops, those are the Romans, and officers from the chief priests, those are the guard at the temple, and the Pharisees, they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. The Romans had their swords, the temple guards had their clubs. Isn't it amazing? What did the Jews and the Romans think of one another? They didn't like each other at all. No, the, the Jews, the zealots in particular, would like to, to overthrow the Roman occupation of their land. They hated one another. But isn't it interesting they become such bedfellows now? Because they have a common hatred of whom? Jesus. Of Jesus. The religious leaders and the political leaders have a hatred of true spirituality. Same thing is true today, you know. Same thing is true in the United States of America. Oh, those religionists and religious leaders have a hatred for true spirituality. They'll label you a Jesus freak. What's a Jesus freak? Someone who simply loves Jesus more than they do, right, and displays it in our life. And we know that the political class, the civil leaders of this country, and I don't care which side of the aisle you're talking about, they hate my Jesus. It was both sides that legislated, gave approval to, made legal same-sex marriage. How insane is that? How demonic? How anti-Christ can you be? Where, well, how have we lost our way? And now they're all accommodating this craziness and this gender dysphoria that they're teaching our children. Oh, there's a heavy price to pay for all of this. Christ hatred is taking place. But here, here, these two enemies come together. Hmm. I think of the geopolitical situation that exists today. Hmm. We have a couple of nations, powerful nations, that really don't like each other, but they've come together because they have a common enemy. Who might that be? Russia, Russia and China. Russia and China have come together in a military alliance. Don't be surprised what may happen to Taiwan tomorrow morning or later on this week or, or next week, but it, and it's inevitable. The kings of the East are going to exercise, flex their muscle. <coughs> the Russians have already flexed their muscle. And how successful have we been to deter them from their goals in Ukraine? <coughs> and who's responsible for all of the bloodshed of the Ukrainians? The United States. Make no mistake about it. The United States. The Obama and Biden administrations have both have been responsible for what has happened in the bloodshed of the Ukraine, if you really understand the geopolitical situation. Now, now I'm not exalting any one party because they're, they're all politicians. They're, they're all animals from a political perspective. And what is politics? Poly being many, ticks, blood-sucking creatures. Right? <laughs> That's what they are. Politics is dirty, dirty, dirty business. Mitch McConnell? Where, where has so much of his wealth come from? China. 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 If you understand his wife and her, his father-in-law's business, they're Chinese, and the business that he holds in China? Who? Which politicians do, not, do the Chinese not have in their pocket? You know, just like the Romans just like the religious leaders of Jesus' day coming together against the common, just like today. And who's suffering most? 
because of all of this? The, the common people. Yeah. Well, I don't want to go too far down that road. You get me on that all day long. Well, they had their weapons coming after a man of peace, coming after the prince of peace. Oh, no, they didn't need any lanterns or torches. Why? Jesus glowed in the dark. Everybody knows that. <laughs> why, why, did, now wait, wait, why did they not need lanterns and torches at this particular time? I'm sorry? Judas said he would. Yeah, Jew, we know that from the previous Gospels that G, Judas is going to reveal who Jesus is by giving him a... <laughs> oh, you betray your master with a kiss, Judas. Hmm. Okay, but I want you to put your thinking cap on. It's Passover. Full moon. Full moon. Thank you. It's a full moon. They don't need torches and lanterns. Why do you think they brought torches and lanterns? What do they think this insurrectionist is going to do? Hide in some cave somewhere. That, that's what they thought. That's why they brought their lanterns and their torches. Was Jesus going to hide in a cave? No, no. For this purpose, he had come into the world. Look at the text. I better move along a little quicker, huh? We're not going to get done. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? What a, what a man of courage, isn't he? Now, he, he's not going to retaliate. He's not going to seek vengeance. He, he, his wrath isn't going to explode upon them. He's a sacrificial lamb of God, the lamb of God who gives his life for the sheep whom he loves, right? The good shepherd. But here, here Jesus knowing, he said, whom are you seeking? And they answered and said, Jesus, the Nazarene, is what it is literally in the Greek, Jesus, the Nazarene. What's a Nazar? What's a Nazarene? In the truest sense, most strict sense. Someone who's, who, some of the Nazar, and that's where the word Nazareth comes from, Nazar, is like the, the vow of the Nazarites, where your life is totally consecrated and given over to God. The world has never seen anybody like Jesus. A man who is totally surrendered and given over to God and for his purposes. You know, that's what God is asking of us, and it's progressive. You know, I, I don't condemn yourself. I'm not asking you to do that. But I'm asking you to do a self-examination that as time goes on, more and more and more of the territory of your life, your heart, your mind should be given over to the Lord. He wants to take, to take possession of 100% of who you are. Do you understand that? Why? Because he wants to give you 100% of who he is. And then you reach that wonderful, beautiful point of what? The vanishing point. Who reached that point? Enoch, and he was no more because God took him, right? Yeah. And so Jesus, the Nazar, the Nazarite, from his birth, even before he was born, it was foretold that he would be the servant of the Most High God, that he would give his life, that his life would be consecrated unto the Lord, set apart, totally given for the purposes of God to rescue a lost and dying world. We could give a little bit back, can't we? And, and, you know, you, you, you listen to me. It's not impossible. You're thinking, no, 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 I'm too selfish. No, 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 that's not what I want. No, no, no. Just pray and ask God. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, work in my heart so that I can give more of my life, my talents of who I am to you for your purposes and for your glory, Lord. Help me, Lord. I want my last days to be my best days in my service to you. Wouldn't, isn't that, wouldn't it be wonderful? Yeah. Mm. Jesus, knowing all things, all things that would come upon him, went forward and said, Whom are you seeking? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth, or really Jesus the Nazarene. And Jesus said to them, I am. The he's not there. The he's not in the Greek text. I am. What is this word, I am? What's it called? Tetragrammaton. It's a tetragrammaton. It's a four-letter name for God. Moses said, who shall I say sent me? I am who I am. Eight times, or seven times, excuse me, in the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to himself as the I am, God himself. What's the result of Jesus speaking who he is, declaring his name? Look what takes place. I am. And what happened? Now Judas betrayed him, also stood there. Verse 6, in particular, now when he said to them, I am, they all got slain in the spirit. 
Now, listen, there's only two places in the Scripture where you'll find records of anybody being slain in the Spirit. This hyper-Pentecostal craziness is just that. It is so contrary to biblical truth. The only two places in the Scripture where someone gets slain in the Spirit, knocked down on the ground by God the Holy Spirit, was here, and what other time? Ananias and Sapphira, when they lied to the Holy Spirit, they dropped dead right in front of Peter. Can you imagine this detachment of Roman troops and the temple guards all coming with their swords and their clubs, their lanterns, their torches? Where is he? I'm right here. I am. And what happened? Brrrm. Now, you, you, you'd think something in their coconut would, you know, so this just isn't normal. This guy's not right. <laughs> it's not going to be a good night, Caesar. <laughs> But foolish, isn't our world crazy? They're, they're, listen, the evidence for who Jesus is and the evidence for the truthfulness of the scriptures is overwhelming. Yeah, 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 yes. There's, a, there's a, 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 a measure of faith that each of us have to have to believe the things that our, our mind can't process, but our heart accepts, right? But there's a whole mountain of evidence upon which we jump off of and take that leap of faith for who Jesus really is. Oh, but like the people in Jesus' day at this time, the people of today, that's the question, what is truth? They don't care. You see, it's not about seeking truth anymore. Yeah, yesterday in the men's study, we were making the comparison between the spiritual revolution that occurred during the Jesus movement in the late 60s, 70s, early 80s. There was a Jesus movement that occurred among a whole generation of people. I, I was, how many of you were part of the Jesus movement? A couple of you, yeah. I, I know what happened. It was miraculous what the Spirit of God had done at that particular time. As compared to what is happening today with the younger generation. 20%, now listen to me, listen to me. 20% of believers today believe this is literally the Word of God and believe that it should be interpreted literally. 20%, one in five. The majority of that one in five, you know who they are? Seniors. The Jesus generation. The majority of young people do not believe that there's any serious body of truth here that should be embraced and lived. Why? What was the difference between the Jesus movement and the Jesus generation, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and the generation of today? What's the difference? The Holy Spirit was moving, but what, what was characteristic of the hippie era? They were seeking truth. And what they were seeking more than anything else was, was true love. They were, they were so sick and tired of the hypocrisy, the materialism, the, the politics. of you know, They just abandoned themselves from all of that. And they were seeking truth. Now, truth wouldn't be found in the gurus of India. Truth wouldn't be found in psychedelic drugs. But where did they discover truth? In the Bible and the person of Jesus Christ. And wow, an explosion of faith, right? A revival. Now, unfortunately today, there is no pursuit of truth. And surely that wasn't the case in Jesus' day at this time. Look what it says. So they all fell back to the ground. And then there were, they, listen, there's not a handful of people. There had to be no less than two or three hundred armed men there. Roman soldiers, temple guards. And then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered and said, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. Oh, Jesus, he is the good, the great, and the chief shepherd of the flock. I think it's John chapter 10 where John calls him the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Isn't that amazing? Jesus isn't concerned about what he's going to be suffering. Although we do understand there is some concern in the other synoptic gospels explained to us that he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. What does Gethsemane mean? Olive press. 
where his life is being pressed. He's under a lot of pressure as, as the man that he was. Fully man, fully God, but as a man, he understood what he was about to face. The pain, the rejection, the suffering, and the greatest, the greatest suffering he ever experienced was what? Separation. Separation from the Father. To be outside of the presence of his Father. Any dog lovers here? You a dog lover? Okay, I have a dog. Snickers. Yeah, now he's not a little lap dog. Snickers, no, no, no. My Snickers in my car. Don't try to get in my car. But Snickers knows that I'm Alpha. And Gail is her friend, his friend, right? Now, when Alpha's not home, what does Snickers act like? He's neurotic. He's, not, he's insecure. He's not stuck. He's not settled. He can't, he can't settle down. He can't calm down. But as soon as I come home, boom, he's fine. Alpha's here. Papa's here. Daddy's here. Ah, it's safe. I don't have to be on guard. Right? Yeah. Now, now, do you ever get in a place, you ever been somewhere where all of a sudden you get this sick feeling in your stomach? You know, my son was in Ukraine recently with a group from his church, uh, men, and he had given everyone a folder to look at when they got in country, and then he'd have a team meeting before they got started with what they had to do. And, uh, but while they were driving to this compound that they were going to have to go into, the, the driver was very, very nervous, and my son was picking up on it and said, why, why are you so well? You know, this, this, you know we never know what's going to happen. We never know. So they had to go through these check stations, these checkpoints. And then finally, they get to this compound where they're supposed to go, and, and they, they open this huge gate, and they drive in, and boom, they close the gate, lock everything down. I mean, you know, and he thought, wow, this is, this is serious. Now, he's a, he was an Army Ranger, Special Forces guy. So in, <laughs> inside the packet for all these other men that he took with him were detailed maps of where you are and if you needed to make an escape, what the escape route would be to where you should rendezvous. And so one of the, one of the guys said, I looked at that and I knew right away what that was, and I closed it up and put it away. <laughs> and he said, the sick feeling in my stomach never went away until we were in Germany again. You ever have that feeling of insecurity, that you're not safe? Oh, boy, I can't even imagine what it must have been like for Jesus to know that he would be absent from his father's presence. For how long? I want to suggest to you in a way that I don't understand. My, my mind can't process. What were you deserving of? What punishment? Eternal death. Eternal death is the punishment for sin. Jesus took upon himself my punishment, your punishment. What would that punishment have been? Eternal separation from God the Father. Now, I don't, I don't understand that. Uh, when I get to heaven, I hope you he help me understand it. Because when I sit down and try to comprehend that, meditate upon that, think on that, smoke starts to come out of my ears. I just... But somehow, someway, Jesus experienced an eternal separation from the Father because that's what we deserved. But he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, and his chief concern now was not what was going to be taking place with him, not his absence from the Father, but to make sure that those whom he loved and those who loved him were safe now. Let these go. Who's in control? The Romans? The temple guards? Who's in control? Jesus says, had they not let them go, he would have made sure that they let them go, right? Yeah, it's wonderful. Make sure you're a Bethany, not a Bethlehem or a Nazareth. What's Bethlehem? Yeah, yeah, Bethlehem, what is significant about Bethlehem? It's where he was born, right? Okay. It's, it's, it's called the house of bread, Bethlehem. Beth is house, Lehem is bread, right? The bread of life born in the house of bread. But Bethlehem is where he was born. That's all. Nazareth. What's so important about Nazareth? It's where he grew up. But there's a place outside of Nazareth that was far more important to Jesus that he would go to almost every day. Where was that? Zuppori or Zephyrah. Who was there? Grandma and Grandpa. Mary's parents. 
Yeah, we probably don't know that, but Jesus was a, was a worker. He was a blue-collar guy. He liked to work, okay? I, I don't know about you. I like working. I like to work. I like to work physically. I enjoy it, you know? And that's the kind of guy Jesus was, and he would go to Zippori to work. He would live in Nazareth. But what was significant about Bethany? Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Listen to me now. Listen to me. You want to be a Bethany. Why? He was born in Bethlehem. He was raised in Nazareth, but he was loved in Bethany. That's why he loved going there. He loved Bethany. Jesus will honor those who honor him. He loves those who love him. Doesn't he? Yes. Jesus said, I have told you I am he, therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom you have given me. I have lost none. Now the other text tells us, except who? The son of perdition, that greedy little betrayer. Mm. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into your sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me to drink? Hmm. The cup of suffering. How many of the guys, the apostles, the fellows with Jesus had swords? Two. They had two swords. We know Peter had one. We don't know who had the other one. But was it an act of cowardice or was it an act of courage? that Peter drew that sword. Courage. Tremendous courage. Now, was he trying to lop off the guy's ear? No. no. What was he trying to do? He wanted to de decapitate him. He was going to take his head off, right? He wasn't messing around. Hmm? And it was, a, it was a tremendous act of courage. He said, Lord, Lord, I'll die for you. And he, he really showed that there, didn't he? Didn't he? Now, we're not going to get there this morning, obviously, because you want to have lunch. I know you do. But then again, if you don't want to have lunch, raise your hand, we'll stay here for the afternoon. <laughs> oh, you don't mean it. <laughs> In a little while, we're going to read next week that another prophecy was fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy saying he would lose none of his own, but there'll be another prophecy that Jesus made. He said, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me. Yes. Who is he speaking of? Peter. Peter. What was the distinguishing difference between this man of such courage, of boldness, of self-sacrifice, and the one who said, I never knew the man? And he cursed and said, I never knew the man. What's the difference? Next week. I want you to think about it. There's a reason for this. And li listen to me, listen to me. Those same reasons can affect your life if you're not thinking correctly. Peter wasn't thinking correctly, and therefore he began to doubt. He be his faith began to weaken, even to the point to where he would curse and deny his Lord. But at this point, he's so courageous, he's so bold. He's the Peter that we love. Wow. Let's go, we're going to continue. This is probably going to take us another couple of weeks to finish this 18th chapter. We want to take it piece by piece by piece, okay? But there's a lot for us here. But what I want you to walk away with this morning is, are you a Nazar? Are you what? A Nazar? Have you really given your life to God? Are you exhausting your life, your person for Jesus? Or are you living for yourself? Judas for himself. A few pieces of silver. And what did it cost him? Everything. Everything. Oh, Peter, James, John, the others gave everything for Jesus. And what did they gain? Far more than $1.3 billion. Let me tell you that. <laughs> far, far more. They gained everything. For what should it gain a man? if he should inherit the whole wealth of the world and lose his soul. It's a bad trade-off. Oh, beloved. Hey, I don't know how much time we have left. Let's purpose from this point on. 
Let's give everything to Jesus. Amen?